Good morning, I'm Jeff Frieden, and I'm reporting on the proceedings of the State of the World Economy and Finance workshop yesterday under the able tutelage and chairmanship of Jean-Claude Trichet. We had a lively discussion. Some were reluctant to leave after the allotted three hours, uh, covering a wide range of topics in international economic and especially financial affairs. We started by noting that there are very substantial risks in the international economic order today. The first, and perhaps the most striking and most worrisome, is continued stagnation in Europe, where the crisis continues to affect both economic activity and financial stability. There is grave concern, both within Europe and around the world, about the near-term future of the European economy and about the long-term implications of economic difficulties in the European economic space. Second, broader concern, source of risk in international economic activity, is that we see the continued potential for macroeconomic imbalances. They have not gone away. China just marked its largest single monthly current account surplus. The German surplus remains large. These macroeconomic imbalances are to some extent exacerbated by large-scale capital flows, which in certain circumstances can be destabilizing. Overall, there was a consensus that we have not really found a full range of appropriate tools to deal with the ways in which an integrated international financial system can both provide the full benefits that it offers to the world without incurring very serious risks, such as those we have observed in the last few years. It was also observed that bad behavior and uh, unacceptable, unacceptably high levels of executive compensation in the financial system risk creating a backlash within the mass public, which would make even more difficult the task of stabilizing and making full use of the benefits of international financial integration. Those are some of the, the risks that we identified in the course of the workshop. However, we also noted that there has been serious progress on many fronts, especially with regard to the harmonization of financial regulatory standards and related issues. There has been some substantial success, both in agreeing upon and implementing Basel regulatory standards with respect to liquidity ratios and leverage. There have been similarly important achievements, such as those discussed around the recent G20 Brisbane summit, as, re as reported by and, uh, in, and, and influenced by and overseen by the Financial Stability Board, especially concerning efforts to stabilize and systematize the resolution of systemically important financial institutions. Also on a more positive note, at least one of us uh, was waxed enthusiastic about the prospects of Abenomics in Japan. We all recognize that there is further action needed in the international financial and economic space, particularly with respect to non-banks and the shadow financial institutions that have caused such great difficulty in the last few years, with respect to credit rating agencies whose role in international financial uh, affairs still remains somewhat puzzling, and on the harmonization of accounting standards. So I would say that overall, the feeling of the panel, the workshop, was that the news is mixed. There have been some notable steps forward in cooperative measures among the major financial and economic centers especially with respect to the harmonization of financial regulation. At the same time, the global macroeconomic situation remains quite troubled and quite troubling, with Europe being the most worrisome cause for concern. Good morning. Uh, my name is Marie-Claire Aoun. I'm the director of the Center for Energy at IFRI, and I uh, have the pleasure to report uh, the workshop two, which was chaired by uh, Professor Richard Cooper and which focused yesterday on the challenges related to energy, climate change, and environment. Uh, the workshop was opened by a recorded speech from the French Minister of Foreign Affairs, Laurent Fabius, who called for a global action from all the actors to fight climate change and for the urgent need to adopt a global agreement on climate change in Paris in 2015. The dynamics of the global energy system are changing. changing. Of course, China is today the main en engine for global energy demand growth, 
But tomorrow, India, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Africa, and Latin America will take over. So today, Asia is at the heart of the energy and environmental challenges. If Asia fails to address these challenges, it will become the world's main concern on the long term. But it will be also the world's savior if it succeeds. Asia could become the world's main concern because the effects of climate change are devastating. It was shown yesterday that climate change has indeed a negative impact on food security and water availability and leads to increased infection diseases. Health risks are also increased with natural disasters and with human displacements. There are also a growing number of viruses and vectors all over the world with the main channel of propagation related to deforestation. Climate change is also expected to increase concentration of air pollutants, and air pollution has been identified as one of the main key risk factors for health in China. So all these facts clearly emphasize the crucial need for adaptation and mitigation strategies. There were, however, some good news yesterday in the workshop. There is a clear shift today in the way energy companies are addressing the climate change issues. Companies are taking initiatives to reduce gas flaring, to improve energy efficiency and the accessibility of all to energy. There was an initiative launched by Christophe de Margerie last year, gathering major oil and gas companies and opening the door to a new kind of cooperation between national oil companies and international oil companies to work collaboratively and share best practices and technical solutions to address climate change and energy sustainability. So there are some changes in our energy system, but this transformation is not strong and fast enough to achieve these two, two degree targets. CO2 emissions are still rising today, so to achieve this target, we need a clear, a strong signal from Paris in 2015. The recent agreement between the US and China did send a powerful message, but there's a need for a wider policy coordination and sharing and a broader dissemination of innovative technologies. So to overcome the energy and environmental challenges, a strong focus should be put on improving energy efficiency, on expanding widely smart grids and renewable energy, on developing electric vehicles, but also on reducing subsidies to fossil fuels. The workshop raised also the role of natural gas, which is considered to be as the less pollutant fuel, fossil fuel, but is it the right answer on the long term? The participants considered yesterday, most of them, that natural gas should be seen as a bridge solution, as a base load capacity to support the development of renewable energy until long-term solutions are widely deployed, such as capture, carbon capture sequestration. It was also highlighted yesterday that the fight towards climate change should be addressed together with the grow, growing global energy demand, with the need to provide cheap and available energy. Countries, it was mentioned that countries such as China should be provided the opportunity to grow. In this context, the expectations from the COP21 in Paris are high, but multilateral negotiations have proven to be a difficult exercise in the UN institutions and were often dominated by geopolitical and economic concerns. Some participants considered that the Paris conference could be a successful diplomacy, but there is a risk that it may not reflect a meaningful agreement. So participants considered that to be successful, the agreement in Paris should be related to sustainable development goals, that the debate on climate change should be shifted from quantitative targets to actions, such as the implementation of adequate financing tool. The participants called also yesterday for a joint global effort to implement carbon pricing mechanisms in order to reduce carbon emissions. So as a conclusion, to be successful, successful, the fight towards climate change should reflect local, regional, and global alliances, including initiatives from the private sector and from the civil society, and should be driven by a strong and sustainable political will. Thank you very much. Uh, just to start, I'd like to explain why uh, we decided to uh, have that discussion on uh, uh, cooperation between Asia and Africa in the field of agriculture. We do believe, I mean, in the small group we were there in the workshop, we, we did believe that uh, uh, increasing uh, the production in the farm sector in Africa is one of the main challenges the world is faced uh, for the next coming years. And we do believe that uh, with respect to agricultural development, 
Asian countries have made considerable headway in many fronts that are relevant to Africa, including agro-processing, drought and famine management, water harvesting and agricultural research, technology transfer, the establishment of a rural and agricultural credit mechanism, the setting up of microcredit and financing system, farm policies, uh, successful economies in Asia have implemented policies and strategies that boost the development of the private sector and of the farm sector. And uh, the first part of our workshop was dedicated to the introduction of different cooperation programs that exist between Asian countries and different African countries. Uh, we all have been told, uh, we all know that Chinese uh, cooperation is very important in different African countries, but we had, uh, by one of the Indian speakers that we had in uh, our workshop, a very comprehensive description of the different actions and programs implemented by different Asian countries, such as Japan, South Korea, uh, Vietnam, this is not something very well known, but Vietnam is a very active country in the uh, agricultural sector in Africa, such as India, and of course, such as China. Dr. Uh, Suraj Kade, uh, Kade uh, one of the Indian uh, speakers, gave us a very deep description of the historical context in which that cooperation took place and helped us to understand better what are the main challenges and problems this cooperation is faced with. Then in the second part of our uh, workshop, we focused some uh, concrete programs that are currently being implemented by Asian stakeholders in some African countries. And because of the experience and competencies of some of our speakers, we focus mainly on the uh, financial sector. We had a very important contribution but by Mr. Uh, Christian Jindal. He is uh, currently the chief executive officer of uh, NAPSCONS. NAPSCONS is the consultancy service uh, a wholly owned subsidiary of NABAR. NABAR is the National Bank for Agricultural Development in India, with more than 7.40 million groups of farmers or rural inhabitants uh, supported by the, the institution. Uh, and a huge experience and deep experience of microcredit uh, financial support to rural development in India. And Mr. Jindal introduced the different uh, programs that NAPSCONS, this specific uh, subsidiary, has implemented uh, in Africa in cooperation with uh, various local development agencies. Uh, these programs can be classified in three different groups. Uh, NAPSCON is providing support to African farmers for promotion of microfinance by undertaking capacity building, uh, assessments of, bank, of local banks, uh, providing uh, initiative loan uh, products, conducting studies on the weaknesses and uh, strengths of the local uh, rural financial institutions. Uh, as a second field of action, NAP, NAP, NAPSCONS also arranges visits of delegates, African delegates in India, so that they can discover and understand the best practices that exist in the uh, Indian farm sector in terms of uh, financial institutions and financial support to farmers. Uh, the third activity of NAPSCON is uh, a new project in some African countries, specifically in Malawi, the creation of a, 
uh, an institute for agricultural development in that country uh, with the support of the government of India. So from that example of NAP NAPSCON, we discussed with the help of some uh, other speakers, specifically Mr. Maxim, he is from Morocco. <coughs> he has a wide experience of rural development in African countries. We discussed the way this financial support could be improved. Our last part, our last period in that workshop was dedicated to, I would say, I would call it a, a prospective approach. What could be done to improve the cooperation between uh, Asian and African stakeholders in the field of agriculture and rural development? And we are very lucky because we had two speakers that gave us a very uh, original approach of two different questions, two different issues. We focused our discussion on one first issue, which is the scientific cooperation between Asian and African countries in the field of plant biology and agronomy, plant quality improvement, I would say. And the second, the second topic that we decided to focus on was the question of farm policy. We had with us Philippe Chalmain, is French, he is well known in France as one of the most important experts in commodity, world commodity markets. And we had a, a deep discussion on the question of farm policy. Uh, what could uh, Asian countries do to help African countries implementing new farm policies? I, I would like to give, to give you some details about those two uh, very important issues because uh, it, it could be, it could be uh, also, a, I would say, a, a proposal for uh, upcoming discussions in uh, uh, the future of uh, world policy conferences. We had Professor Hod Wing from the University of Arizona with us. Professor Hod Wing is a geneticist, probably one of the most important experts in rice production in the world today. And uh, he, is, uh, he is presently appointed by the AXA uh, Foundation, uh, the AXA Endowed uh, Chair of Genome, Genome Biology and Evolutionary Genomics at the International Rice Institute, uh, Research Institute in Los Banos, the Philippines. Uh, this institute has played, as you probably know, a significant role in over 30 plant and animal genome sequencing projects, which include both Asian and African rice, maize, barley, soybean, oil palm, and tomato. And road uh, research interest nowadays is the question of the use of genome biology to discover and implement su sustainable solutions to help solve world anger and to feed the planet. He, his current focus uh, is to understand the genome biology of the wild relatives of rice, which possesses many important biotic and uh, stress uh, traits that have been lost in present day cultivars. Uh, as consequence of domestication. Hod has told, has told us about a very important program, which is the International Ohiza Map Alignment Project, development of a genius uh, wide comparative genomic platform to help solve the nine billion people uh, question. Uh, as you know, rice is one of the most uh, important food crops in the world and provides more than 20% total calories to half of the world population. And as the population increases uh, more than 2 billion by uh, year 2050, uh, we must find solutions to uh, grow enough food to, to feed the world in a more sustainable and environmentally uh, sound manner. So, this program is an, is an international cooperation program that would help uh, farm, farmers in Africa and producers in Asia to cooperate in the sense to improve the quality of the different uh, vari variety of rices used in the two continents. We had uh, finally a very important discussion led by uh, some comments done by Philippe Chalmain on farm policy. Philippe Chalmain noticed that a in all Asian countries, the, uh, in the, the growth of the local farm production has been 
closely linked to the fact that government implemented farm, farm price policy supports, uh, price guarantees, at least at the first period of uh, the starting development in those countries. And he said that uh, one of the most important contribution Asian countries could, could give to the, uh, the, the takeoff of uh, agricultural pro production in different African countries could be to help African countries to implement such uh, farm policies that would stimulate farmers to produce more and to invest in new technology. He noticed that in all, Afri in all Asian countries, and it is true also in Brazil, I'm from Brazil, uh, the takeoff of the uh, local agricultural production has been closely linked to some guarantees of prices provided by government. He also recognized that in African countries, the challenge is much more difficult to address that than it was the case in Europe when the common agricultural policy started by the 60s, as far as, say, uh, in many African countries, uh, most of the population is more and more urbanized, and urban dwellers have a very low purchase power. So it, it, we have to define, we have to design a very sophisticated and a, a, a well-balanced policy that could provide farmers the stimulus to produce and that could, uh, uh, kept, that could keep the capacity of consumers to buy the food. And in that sense, an international cooperation, he mentioned, for instance, the experience of the Bill Gates Foundation that is already provided support to such initiative in the sense of providing the uh, finan financial resources local government needs if they want to uh, build such support policy which are costly and which cannot depend only on local taxpayers and or local consumers. To sum up, I would say that uh, with a few people, we were a small group, we were very creative, and uh, we uh, had a very interesting new proposal by the end of our discussion. Thank you. I think we can open the floor to any questions, comments, uh, additions, subtractions from those either who were present at a workshop or who weren't. I can't see very well out there, but why don't we start over here. Is there a microphone somewhere? Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Tatsuo Master from uh, NUCB Graduate School in Nagoya, Japan. I have a question to, seven questions, but I'll limit to just one, to the workshop one. I, after hearing your report, I became a bit gloomy because the climate of economy may not be as promising as it should be. But what was the discussion on the relevance or competence of multinational organizations like uh, IMF and World Bank in underpinning the recovery of the stagnating economy? Thank you. That's a good question. We, most of our focus was on uh, broader trends. We did talk about the role of international institutions, particularly the relative success in some of the initiatives such as harmonizing financial regulation, the role of the BIS, um, the Financial Stability Board under the aegis of the, of the BIS. Uh, and it was also pointed out, so I guess I would, there are two parts to it. The first is that in the financial realm, the, the fund has played less of a role and more of a role in the financial regulatory area has been played by the BIS and there was substantial discussion and some uh, con self-congratulation, I suppose, deservedly so, that there has been substantial progress in, f in, the re in the harmonization of financial regulation under the aegis of the BIS, the FSB, uh, the, the three rounds of, four rounds of Basel Accords. Um, with respect to other forms of international cooperation, it was pointed out, I think very correctly, that in the, in the immediate aftermath of the onset of the crisis in 2008, there was quite a striking degree of successful coordination and cooperation among the major monetary authorities of the principal financial areas. Not so much an international institutional response, but a cooperative response that was successful at coordinating monetary policies in a way that 
frankly, a lot of people would not have expected before September, October of 2008. So on the one hand, there has been progress under the, in the institutional realm in financial <coughs> harmonization. On the other hand, there has been substantial and successful cooperation among major monetary authorities. Other observations, questions, comments, objections? Anecdotes. Ah. Uh, my name is Yutaka from Japan. And the agriculture issue I am very interested in. Uh, you mentioned the, even Vietnamese are helping the, uh, African the uh, sort of agriculture products and the increase of some transfer, some of their technology. What sort of background of Vietnamese to help the African, because there's some sort of donation, um, sort of more benevolent activity, or some strategic activity for, for Vietnam. I'm really surprised. I'm very happy to hear that Japan is also participating, and China is so well known, but I'm first time to hear the Vietnamese are helping Africans. Well, uh, Japan has uh, a, a relatively very uh, old experience in Africa, as you probably know, the Japanese uh, scientific institutions have been in charge of a very important program to improve the quality of rice produced in some African countries. Uh, Vietnam nowadays, I was mentioning in my, in my introduction yesterday uh, the example of Vietnam because Vietnam has launched a very interesting program to support to... Uh, stimulate uh, corn production in some areas in Mozambique. Of course, in each of the uh, examples that one could mention of cooperation with African countries, they always have some, uh, I would say, strategic uh, objectives that overpass the fact that you uh, apparently uh, help local people. Uh, the well-known example of Chinese cooperation is, has been very much discussed in, the, in recent years. It has been said, for instance, that China was uh, even buying lands or uh, implementing land-grabbing strategies in different African countries. Uh, one, uh, we have to separate uh, what is uh, probably uh, a sort of myth and uh, what is the reality, but they, there's always a, a strategical uh, vision. I would say that most of the Asian countries do understand, do see Africa as a, a continent that could provide the raw materials and food uh, staples that they, need, they will need to import in the, in the coming future. And probably Vietnam is in such a situation. This is a case also for India. Our Indian speakers did mention that uh, uh, some uh, uh, cooperation exists with, between uh, Indian companies and uh, uh, partners in Africa and that the final uh, objective of that cooperation from the Indian point of view is to diversify the supplying of uh, domestic markets. And probably it is the case also in the case of Vietnam. I do not see uh, this as uh, uh, a, a very important problem as far as it is not uh, implemented uh, uh, without uh, uh, taking into account the uh, question of uh, the supply of local market, increasing the, the, the necessity to increase local production for, uh, to, to supply local consumers. But uh, we also mentioned in our uh, discussions that before Africa to become a supplier of uh, Asian countries, uh, one of the most important uh, challenge that has to be uh, faced is the question of transports and infrastructures and communication. You, you, cannot, you cannot produce rice in, in Mali or in uh, Kenya to export to Asian countries if you do not have a more efficient uh, transport system. Over there on the platform. Thank you. Good morning. Carlos Perez Verdia from Mexico. Um, Ms. Aoun, I wonder if you could elaborate on what the group thought about uh, the COP in Peru 
um, and specifically whether it is uh, success in Peru is a prerequisite for success in Paris. Um, and Mr. Frieden, if, if I may, um, the, the large flows you were talking about, and you mentioned this yesterday at the workshop, you, you see uh, some of the trouble or the source of them coming from the large imbalances that still exist. Um, however, five years or six years after the crisis, a huge crisis, uh, we still see pretty much the imbalances uh, being what they are. So I wonder if you see some kind of wedge between the real and the monetary economies that somehow we are failing to grasp and seeing how to resolve. Thanks. Yes, thank you. We, we, we did indeed talk about international negotiations and more specifically about the COP20, uh, but it is more seen as a sort of stepping stone towards the COP21 that, uh, that the main uh, factors should be should start to be discussed at the COP20 and the, the, the main decisions will be taken during the next year. But what was also interesting is that uh, Mr. Vuk Jeremy, who had a long experience in the UN institutions, talked and insisted about the fact that uh, the international negotiations on the climate issues are sometimes very difficult because they are sometimes, um, uh, that, 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 that there are more priority short-term concerns which are uh, which are brought on the table such as geopolitical concerns uh, or, or, or more uh, issues related to the economic crisis so the discussion was also around how to uh, make the climate change issues be the priority topics because these are they are the priority on the on the long term um, and cl clearly the, the f we, we we then focused on the fact that if paris is successful it will need to really uh, move the discussions from the targets to the actions uh, so to work more on the financing uh, issues to work more on mitigation and strat and, 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 and uh, adaptation strategies and also there was a clear focus yesterday on the fact that we need to work on carbon pricing mechanisms uh, and, 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 and to, to improve the, the pricing of carbons globally and not only in some regions, not to, in order to avoid any problem in terms of competitiveness. On your point, we didn't discuss the issue in great detail, so all I can do is give you my own view. Um, and I think the, 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 my concern, and I think it was echoed by others, is that typically one would want capital flows mm -hmm in response to opportunities for productive activities, capital flows to reinforce uh, productive investment in various economies. I mean, as, as we all know, that bar borrowing is not a bad thing if the borrowed funds are used to increase the productivity and productive capacity of the societies in question. And that happens to a very large extent. The problem that I think we see is given the size, the efficiency, the speed with which capital can move around the world, and the extraordinarily low real interest rates in the advanced industrial countries, uh, the financial markets are exquisitely sensitive to short-term movements, even transient movements in rates of return. And so that, I think, leads to what we've observed, which is that we get massive sloshing of funds from one country to another without a real sense that this is going into productive activity. And in as much as that's the case, I think it does hold the danger of creating the kinds of boom-bust cycles in response to large-scale capital flows that we've seen over the last 10 years. I'm really, in some sense, repeating what I said yesterday, but I didn't hear anyone disagree with me, so I'll repeat it and say that it was the sense of the workshop. I don't know if Monsieur Trichet agrees, but that, that, I think, is the kind of concern that we observe, and it's not something that's directly amenable, at least in the first instance, to financial regulatory harmonization because it's a response, it's a, a perfectly market-based response of financial markets to the search for yield and the existence of an extraordinary facility of moving money around the world in response to very small differences in, in, in rates of return. So I, I don't think we've really addressed the underlying problem, uh, which, which requires both variations or innovations in national government policy and at the international level. That's my, as I say, that's my view, not necessarily, I, the rest of the workshop dissociates itself from my view. Other observations? There ain't no objection, I think we can move on to the next session, more or less on time.
Thank you all. Thank you.